So um, today we're going to talk about growing and cooking cool season vegetables. And so I'm Andrea Nikolai and I have Anne with me here. So Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I'm Ann Yasalanis. I'm the Residential Horticulture Extension Agent and Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator with UFIFIS Extension in Polk County. Okay, and then I'm Andrea Nikolai, like I alluded to, and I'm a registered dietitian and I work also in Polk County then as a family and consumer sciences agent. So I teach nutrition and chronic disease classes and um, anything to help you guys um, feel better. So today, if you haven't used Zoom very much, um, just in case, there is um, the chat box at the bottom. And sometimes it's hard to find. So if you hover over the bottom or the top of the screen, it'll show up, it'll usually pop up. And if you don't see it as one of the options, there's a um, three dots and it says more. You can click on that and find the chat box. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in there. We'd love to. Uh, um, hopefully have time to take them. So we have a lot of fun stuff today. So we're going to see you jam-packed, um, but get you the main messages. So then I, I do have a short evaluation that I'm going to send following the webinar. And if you guys can do that, it helps us so much. We read those um, just to help us figure out, you know, like even describing the classes, you know, and things like that to help the, us be better on these things. So um, if you would do that, it doesn't take that long and we'd love it. So, um, Anne, you can take it away here. And do you want to share your screen? Um, I don't have it pulled up. Maybe I okay. could just take the, I should ask you before. I'm sorry. Should I, can I just take the remote? Yep. Okay. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to mention for some reason I have some kind of weird pop-up hanging over where I type into the chat box. So, I can see everybody's chats and I'll be able to read them. Um, if I type something strange that's not spelled properly, it's because I can't see everything I'm typing. So I'll try to answer everything <laughs> um, with my voice. <laughs> um, yeah, so as Andrea mentioned, we're gonna um, talk about um, planting a vegetable garden and I'll, I'll talk about all of that and then um, uh, mention um, quite a few of the, the cool season crops that we can grow now. And this is the time to garden in Central Florida. And so um, just for time's sake, we won't cover every single vegetable, but there are lots of them that you can grow now. And then Andrea is going to talk about how to use what we're growing now in our kitchen. So make sure I have, there we go. Okay, so I will talk about growing cool season vegetables and I'll I'll read the chat um, I'll probably pause for the um, growing um, questions after I'm done speaking so um, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat now but I'm just going to go through everything first so um, we're going to talk a little bit of first about site preparation um, when you're preparing to plant and grow vegetables and um, no matter what season we're in it's important to make sure that your yard has the growing conditions suited to what you plan to grow. So um, whether it's containerized plants or raised beds or stuff in the ground or uh, using a soilless method like hydroponics, um, providing those plants with what you need will help you be successful. And we're gonna cover all of that. So generally speaking, vegetables are gonna need to grow in well-drained soil. Um, you can make your own or purchase items to make that. Um, we have a nice handout on making your own potting mix through the University of Florida. Vegetables will need sun. So make sure that you have a spot about six hours a day. So if you were thinking, hey, I'm gonna grow them in the backyard and then all of a sudden realized you needed to have about six hours of sun, well then you may need to look at something like you know, containerized plants for another area of your yard. So um, depending on what you have on your site, you may need to make some alterations to how you plan to grow those, those vegetables. Okay, so if we don't have that six hours of sun, we could have a reduction yield, which would be too bad since we're growing all of this to, to eat. So um, potentially if you have too much shade, there are some, some herbs that you could 
um, grow instead. And then finally, when we're selecting a location and prepping for our garden, we wanna make sure that it's easy to maintain and harvest. And by that, I mean, anything that you can do to make it easier for you will make vegetable gardening more appealing. So if you locate your vegetables near a water source, it's easier to apply that water to them versus, you know, you know, the vegetable garden's way out in the yard and I have to drag a hose and I don't feel like doing that today. So what we're talking about is making it easy for you to, to maintain it and then harvest as well. If you use gardening tools routinely, uh, maybe keeping those near the garden or close by so you don't have to do a lot of work before you go out and, um, you know, use those tools in the vegetable garden. Um, put your compost bin nearby so that you can add materials from the garden easily and then the compost back into the garden. And when you're ready to harvest your crops too, make the trip out to harvest easy as well. So if you're in the kitchen and you're thinking, oh, I should have grabbed you know, lettuce or uh, parsley or whatever, um, is it gonna be easy for you to just run out and grab that? Or is it gonna be like, oh, well now I've got to find some shoes and go, you know, go through multiple doors. And I mean, sometimes a door isn't enough of a deterrent <laughs> to get out and get what you need. So we wanna make it easy. So you know, right outside the door by your kitchen or, or something like that to make it easy for you to want to use those things that you're growing. And then finally, like with all plants in your landscape, make sure you have enough room to grow um, what you've decided to grow. Um, so I'm talking about size of those plants that you're growing. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the specific plants. And then, you know, just following these general guidelines for planning um, will help get you started on the right foot and will hopefully solve any issues you might have later. Whoops, I think there's a bit of a lag, sorry about that. Um, where can you grow vegetables? A lot of different places. Um, this first slide shows um, containers. A lot of vegetables are really easy to grow in containers. Um, from the left, you can see those are carrots. So you can sow your carrots right in a container. The middle picture shows buckets of tomatoes. And then we've got some um, Swiss chard in those last two pictures on the right, growing in different types of containers as well. So containers or buckets, if you have those on hand, are really easy to use um, when you're, you're trying to find a place to plant vegetables. Of course, if you have the space, you can grow vegetables in the ground. Um, particularly if you're looking at growing something big and vining that we'll talk about today, you may want to select at least part of your vegetables to be grown in the ground. Um, a lot of people like to grow vegetables in raised beds, and you can see from the photo, there's lots of different designs for raised beds as far as layout and height and all of those sorts of things. Um, so there's a lot you can do with a raised bed garden as well. Um, this shows a couple of different methods for um, hydroponic systems. And, and what that means is you're growing without soil. So these are growing in either some sort of media or just straight in water. And um, there are systems you can purchase um, or build your own type of system as well. And then finally consider just incorporating your vegetables into the landscape as you see in the photos here. Um, you know, um, the picture on the far left shows in the foreground here some blueberries. So blueberries make a nice shrub and you get the benefit of being able to eat them as well. So think outside the box a little bit and start plugging in um, vegetables and herbs and anything edible into your ornamental landscape. And as we go through and talk about the, um, the plants as well, you'll see that quite a few of them have a lot of ornamental qualities that would be great for your landscape. Okay, so after we've selected a site or selected a container or, or kind of figured out what we wanna to do to, to grow our vegetables, um, it's helpful to create a plan just like you would in your landscape. So you may say, okay, I'm growing everything in the ground or I'm doing a combination of raised beds and containers or you know, containers and in the ground. There, there could be a couple of options that you decide to do depending on um, what you, have um, in your landscape and um, what you're going to be growing as well. 
because um, containers might not work for some things quite as easily. Um, so create that plan, make a list of the supplies you need, like seeds and transplants and tools. And then I would always suggest using some sort of gardening journal. Um, our master gardeners sell a 12 month gardening guide and journal um, that's specifically for making plans and recording things. Um, a plain notebook would work fine. You know, you can see an example here. So anything that will help you garden season to season and year to year, that'll be a really valuable reference to you for a couple of different reasons. Um, especially as we move into talking about this next topic, which is um, crop rotation. And that's pretty important. And while you think you may remember that last season or the you know, two seasons ago, you planted beans here. And for certain, you'll remember that next season not to plant them there. Well, that's easier said than done. So having some sort of notebook or calendar or journal to record what you're planting season to season will help you not only remember how um, you need to be rotating crops, but also, you know, you can record successes and maybe some, some tricky stuff that you encountered with some of these um, vegetables that you're growing as well. So all of that, that will be very helpful to you. Um, and we do want to have a plan for crop rotation because it's really a very important part for managing pests. And we do have to remember um, that when we rotate, um, and so what that means is um, in this raised beds this season, I planted tomatoes. Well, I don't want to continue to plant tomatoes in that same spot season to season, or I'll have is issues with pests. I want to rotate, and I want to rotate totally out of our plant family. And we have a really nice chart in our vegetable crop rotation fact sheet. So you don't have to write any of this down. This is in a fact sheet um, that we have produced. And this is just kind of a little helpful tool because you need to rotate totally out of plant family when you're rotating your crops. So for example, um, if you look at the brassicaceae family, um, there that has arugula, turnips, mustard, kale, collards, all of those things there. Well, you can't go from planting mustards and then radishes, even though, yes, they are a different crop. We got to get all the way out of that plant family when we're rotating. So this is a really helpful guide because it has, you know, a lot of the really common stuff that will be growing in our landscapes here. So um, just remember to rotate out of family. We do have a, in, in that same fact sheet, um, a sample plan and again, you can follow these sorts of things or as long as you have some sort of journal or calendar, whatever it might be, um, it's really, really helpful to record those things. We also need to, as we're planning, prepare our site when we get to the point of being ready to plant um, and, and getting our soil ready. And there's a few things on this slide that um, I wanted to point out. Again, another another reason to record things or write down stuff that you're doing in your landscape, because if you're going to be adding compost, it's important that you're adding it at the right time. So whether you are making notes of when you are adding it or in your calendar, you have a reminder of when you need to add it. Those are really important things to know because we want to make sure we're adding these things at, a, at the proper time. So if we look at the animal manures, those have to be added 90 to 120 days from planting. So, you know, you'll really need to give yourself a reminder there. That's quite a bit of time. Um, and really that organic matter should be tilled into the soil three weeks prior to planting. So again, um, unless you're great at remembering stuff, I would personally have to have all of this written down so that I remember what I'm supposed to be doing. Now I do recommend just for ease that any um, manures be added to a compost pile and then the compost be added to the to the planting site just because it's a lot easier to do that way um, rather than having to wait that 90 to 120 days and finding the manure at that time it's just if you continually add it to your compost pile and then you add your completely composted material um, it makes it a little easier um, and you can see also uncomposted organic material we're adding at least 30 days from planting and the reasons for that is um, that because that compost will continue to break down if it's, if the materials will continue to break down if they're not fully composted. And so that could have a lot of problems if you're trying to germinate seeds there. Um, so, so just another few things to remember as we're talking about preparation. If you plant in containers, 
um, you will need to purchase or make some sort of well-drained potting mix. Um, it will have to be replaced annually. So again, if you have a compost bin nearby, you can put the spent soil in there, make a new mix each year, perhaps using some of that compost that you already have. And of course, there's always an option for a soilless system, those hydroponic systems that I showed a few slides back. Um, and we do have um, workshops and webinars strictly on gardening without soil. It's a kind of a whole other science in itself. So we've talked about selecting a site and planning and crop rotation. Um, talked about how to, to plant our, our plants in the right we will need to talk about how we're going to be watering them because particularly at this time of year, um, you know, we don't have a lot of rainfall. So irrigation is gonna be part of our site prep and plan because we need to figure out how we're gonna do it. Um, and really the easiest thing to do is to um, use a micro irrigation system. And I'll show you a couple of different um, setups of that on the next um, slide. Um, of course, you can always hand water, um, but again, if that becomes difficult for you, um, you know, I hate to have anything where you'll just all of a sudden give up on gardening or it's too much work and that sort of thing. And micro irrigation is very easy. You can buy very small kits and simply, um, you know, hook it up to the outdoor faucet, put a little timer on it and run it where it needs to go. You can make it look fancy and hide it or not, it's up to you. I mean, the main thing is it needs to function and irrigate those gardens. So a couple different ways that, that um, it can be done, and these are just a couple examples. Of course, you can do lots of things with micro-irrigation. It's very versatile. Um, so in the top left photo, you can see micro-irrigation going from a PVC pipe into the raised beds. Um, so that's one option for it. You can do a little bit of plumbing, not necessary though. Um, in the top right photo, you can see a sample design where micro irrigation comes off of outdoor faucet. You can dig a really, you know, shallow trench and lay that um, that that vinyl tubing underneath the grass if you need to, and pop it right back out into your your raised beds or whatever you have um, for your garden nearby. The bottom left photo shows micro irrigation being used in containers. I definitely think this is something really easy to do. Containers tend to dry out more quickly than plants in the ground or raised bed. Um, so having um, a little drip system there would be really helpful. And then finally, the bottom right photo is sort of the same thing as in that top left photo, except for instead of the PVC pop outs where they've hooked up the micro irrigation being on the outside of the raised bed, these are on the inside of the raised bed, probably just for um, aesthetic reasons, you can hide it a little better, but either thing would work. And we do have classes on micro irrigation as well. So we're gonna get into some of the vegetables that you can grow now during the cool season. Uh, something to make note of here is um, there may be times where you need to protect what you are growing from cold and cool temperatures. So um, make sure you have a plan for that. So whether it's, you know, easiest thing for you to do is group everything together and cover it with the freeze cloth. That's something you need to have planned and ready to go. Or, you know, it's easiest for you to move everything into a garage and containers, you know, have that kind of thought in the back of your head as you're, you're starting to plant. There are so many things you can grow this time of year. So um, there's a lot you can do. So first thing we're gonna talk about is lettuce. Lettuce comes in four major types, uh, crisp head, butterhead, leaf, and romaine. They can all be grown in Florida, but leaf lettuce often works best because it's more suited to our mild climate. And you can continually harvest um, all of these lettuces throughout the season. Um, and you can see there are varieties um, and in our Florida vegetable gardening guide, um, as well as in our uh, Master Gardener 12 month gardening guide and journal, we have all varieties for all vegetable crops listed. So, you know, we're gonna be selecting varieties that do well for um, Central Florida gardens. Really important for us to remember. Drop start from seed or purchase transplants. It's not too late to start from seed. Um, you can cut and eat and seed lettuce all winter long. So it's a great one to get started with if you've never grown anything before. 
You want to come sit up front with me? Sorry, I've got a little bit of delay in my slide here. Oh, guys, guys. Sit, sit up here. You can watch my thing with me for now. We've got a little bit of time. Before. Sorry, Ann, it's me. I was just making sure. That's okay. I don't know why my slide's not advancing now. <laughs> You're, this is what happens when we share screen. You should be good now. I, okay. I take it back. Let me give it a try. There we go. Sorry, yes, Ann. This is the next one. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing is onions. They take a long time to produce because they're making that big bulb underground. For our bulbing varieties, you need to start them August to November, and they would be harvested the following spring or early summer, so it's pretty late for those. Um, bunching varieties can start in the fall, winter, or spring, and the multipliers can be divided up annually. Um, and so the funny thing is, when we think about cool season gardening, we're thinking, okay, it's going to be cool and then I'll start. But typically for us here, we plan and get ready to start our cool seed as, season seeds and gardens in like July and August. So <laughs> it's a little confusing if you're not used to gardening um, in Central Florida. Um, next one we have is turnips. So turnips can be planted September to February. Um, they can be grown from seed. Um, you'll need to space them three inches apart if you are going to grow them for the roots. So some people um, grow them to eat the roots and some grow to eat the greens and some grow to eat both. Um, so you need to kind of have an idea of what you're doing when you plant them. So if you're just growing to harvest the greens, you can plant them closely together because you're not going to be worried about um, the development of those turnips there. So the roots can take 40 to 60 days to harvest and the greens you can harvest throughout the season, just we don't wanna over harvest the greens if we are trying to develop the roots. Next thing we have is carrots. So um, August to March in Central Florida, um, you can kind of stagger the planting of carrots because of that long planting range. Um, and the reason I say that is because they do take 70 to 120 days to harvest. So that's quite a long time. And if you plant tons and tons of carrots and then all of a sudden have tons and tons of carrots to eat, that might not work out best for you. So you may wanna plant smaller amounts and just kind of stagger that planting from August to March. So you have carrots continually throughout that, that growing time. Um, and you can plant them with quick to germinate crops like radish and lettuce. So you can kind of companion plant those there because they do take so long to produce. Um, eggplants um, planted from August through September and then again from January to February. Um, lots of varieties with lots of different colors of fruit. So um, there's this dark purple, there's white, there's yellow, there's kind of variegated. They all have a very similar taste. They just look different. So um, as long as you're selecting a Florida variety, you should be good. Um, they can grow up to six feet tall. So uh, they may need to be staked in the garden. So just be mindful of that as you're planning your space. Another one to be watching out for as you're planning is English peas. This is another one. Um, this is actually a climber. So it's not one that gets tall, but because it's climbing and vining, um, it will need some sort of support. So um, that's another thing to think about when you're, you're planning your space. Do you need to have some sort of, you know, like a tomato cage, a trellis, a fence nearby? How are you going to support these things that either get tall or have a climbing tendency on them? So our English peas can be planted from January to March. Um, and they're different than, than the southern peas. Those can be grown in the summer months. And this is just our English or snap peas that we grow now. Tomatoes. This is a, the big one. Lots of people want to plant tomatoes. Lots of people have trouble planting tomatoes. Um, and the main thing to remember that here in Central Florida, they are a cool season crop. If you grow tomatoes, make sure you select disease resistant varieties. And rotation is super important because they are so susceptible to nematode issues. And that's a um, something that affects their roots. So some people find that planting in containers is easily easier. Um, and if you are planting in a raised bed or in the ground, you really need to rotate those. Um, something to just kind of have in your mind as you're purchasing either seeds or plants is to know if whatever you are purchasing and then growing is 
uh, indeterminate or determinate. And so indeterminate means that it um, will continually produce throughout the season. Um, determinate means that it's going to give you a single crop. And most people are going to want an indeterminate variety so they can continually harvest off that tomato plant throughout the season. But it's up to you too. Um, winter squash. So there's a pretty short window here to grow winter squash. They can start in January through April. But after we get some, some hot weather, we can, we can have a really hard time growing winter squash. So you can start the seeds inside um, and plant as soon as any danger of frost and freeze have planted passed. Um, and with our squash, um, they do get really big. So this is a vine and they have they take up a lot of space. So any of these large crops that are vining, um, you're gonna need a pretty significant amount of space and a large raised bed or in the ground is probably gonna be the easiest way to grow it. Conversely, radishes don't take up much, much space at all and they germinate really quickly. And they are a great plant to put in with um, lots of other different, different plants. So companion plant, because they um, produce so quickly, um, a companion plant would be something that takes a long time to, um, to harvest. So this is a 20 to 30 day from harvest. A good companion plant would be something that would be you know, 80 to 100 days from harvest because you can have two crops growing at the same time. And you can sow seeds of radish directly into the landscape. So it's a really good time to grow greens. I have a list of them here. Um, cool season is our, our, our best time for them. They can all be started from seed. Um, they're about 40 to 60 days, although collards might be needing up to 90 days to harvest. Um, with all of the greens, you can either harvest the entire bunch at once, or you can pick a few leaves at a time and really you would be starting from the outer edges and harvesting those older leaves first and then um, pick a few leaves at a time and then you'll get a continual harvest of those which is what most people do if for some reason you know you're going away and you're worried about the harvest you can take the whole plant and you know make sure you eat it or freeze it or whatever you're going to do so we're going to quickly talk about the specific greens so this is this is collards they can be started from seeds or transplants six to eight weeks from harvest lots of good varieties for Florida. And we'll provide you with all of these varieties um, because they are all listed in our vegetable gardening guide. Kale, September to February, lots of um, varieties for those as well. Most of these plants you can start from either seed or transplant. The, the main thing to remember what is that if you start from seed, it will take you longer to harvest than if you start from transplant, obviously, because the transplant's already grown a little bit. Um, mustards can grow January through March. Um, good time to grow Swiss chard as well. Um, same thing applies here, harvesting those outer leaves first and you get that continual harvest. Um, same thing with spinach, January through March, harvest the outer leaves first. Um, the same thing applies to arugula and all the lettuces as well, as far as harvest is concerned. So you can harvest the whole thing, you'll just lose the plant. Um, all of our melons, again, like the squash, lot, very large vining plants. So um, again, lots of space, 12 or 18 to 24 square feet per plant. Um, some of those squashes and melons will need about that same space. Um, these are 80 to 100 days to harvest. So they take a long time. Um, fungus can be an issue with all of our melons and squash, so crop rotation is very important and managing um, water is also important as well. Again, allow lots of room for vines of melons to spread, and there are quite a few melons that you would grow. So these are things that we're harvesting 70 to 100 days later, and you don't think about starting them now, but that is when you start these, these crops that are going to get so big and take so long to produce. Um, we can also plant our potatoes as well as sweet potatoes that we'll talk about in a minute. They are 80 to 100 days to harvest and you can plant them now 
um, all the way through February. And there are some varieties from Florida as well if you've never grown potatoes here. And our sweet potatoes, um, these are a great crop, um, particularly for somebody that's just starting vegetable gardening. Um, they can be grown pretty well year round. Um, cool season, middle of the summer, all of that, they work really well. Um, you can start your own sweet potatoes from slips or you can purchase them as well. You can grow your own slips. Um, that's what they are started as and, and they're pretty easy to grow. And um, most people get at least a few sweet potatoes when they start those growing. So um, we're gonna be selecting Florida varieties for them as well. Time to start our broccoli and cauliflower, um, 80 to 100 days to harvest. They, um, both broccoli and cauliflower need those cool temperatures and the full sun that we get in our cool season here in Central Florida. All right, and then the last one we're gonna talk about quickly is cucumbers. So this is another vining plant. So trellis, fence, anything like that to allow it to vine up and hold on. Um, you can sow seeds directly into the ground or purchase a small transplant. And you can see from the list here, there are so many varieties of cucumbers and this is a good one to try and have fun with just because of the wide variety of, um, of crops available. Um, as far as general maintenance and pest control for vegetables, obviously there are gonna be different pests that um, affect different vegetable crops that you're growing. So it's important to be aware of those for sure, but this is just some general information um, and really kind of remembering that um, cultural practices are really going to affect the health of our garden. And so by that, I mean, how we water, how we plant, how we keep an area clean um, and that sort of thing. Those are our cultural practices, things we're doing. So um, by using proper irrigation techniques and not overwatering and allowing for good drainage, we'll have healthier crops that way. Growing our plants in the proper pH for most vegetables, um, that'll help um, minimize nutrient related issues, um, that we could have at other pHs. So um, soil pH for our vegetables is about five and a half to seven. Um, if you need a pH test done, our master gardeners do that. Um, in our office, you can drop off soil and they test every couple of weeks and it is $3. You can get a more um, intense pH test um, from the University of Florida Soils Lab and you can mail your soil up to them. I think it's $10 now for those tests. Um, other maintenance and cultural practices, just keeping the garden tidy. So that means like proper spacing, allowing airflow, clean between rows, not a lot of weeds, removing dead plants. Um, um, all of those things will help keep pests at bay. And then even adding some flowering plants to attract beneficial insects might help. Um, so planting some of our um, plants that attract um, um, some of our beneficial wasps or ladybugs or those sorts of things around your garden um, or just having them throughout your yard will help out a lot. And then um, again, I'm gonna go back to our crop rotation because that is so important. And then this is my um, final slide as far as talking about um, growing our vegetable crops. Um, just some, some quick tips I thought might be helpful. Um, the first one here is just talking about succession planting and that's when you space out planting times of the same crop. So just like I talked about with the carrots. So what that means is again, planting a little bit now and a little bit later. So you get smaller amounts of the crop harvested for a longer period of time. So just think about it. Do you want you know, 25 pounds of carrots um, in a matter of a week or would you rather have that kind of spaced out a little bit? Um, the second one, um, saving money. So there are different ways you could do that. Um, there's lots of seeds in a seeds packet and while it might not seem like a large cost savings, if you purchase a lot of seeds or you know, do mail order and you're purchasing specialty seeds, you could consider splitting up packets between garden friends and save some money there. There are also seed banks locally where, where gardeners can share seeds for free. 
Um, a few of the libraries have them. We have one at our office. It is not open right now due to COVID, but when we are, that's a great way to share seeds for free. Um, the third one is just staying aside ahead of pest problems um, so that you don't have expensive, um, you know, things happening later on. So our scouting and monitoring for pests and um, practicing all those good cultural maintenance practices will help save money on pest control and wasted plants later. And also, you know, making sure that you're applying the, the right amount, the recommended amount of fertilizer and water, because those are things that you'll also be spending your money on and certainly don't want to overuse those either. Um, for starting your own compost pile, I mean, it's not only a great way to recycle yard waste, but um, if you're doing something where you're needing to purchase bags of soil or bags of compost, um, consider creating your own to reduce the amount of money you're spending there. And then finally, if you're growing vegetables in order to save money, um, if you've ever grown vegetables before, that's pretty tricky. Usually we end up spending more money um, just trying to grow them. But if you grow a lot of what you're currently spending money on at the grocery store, it certainly is a possibility. And if you can share between neighbors or friends with some of your crops as well, it's certainly possible to save money at the grocery store. Okay, so that is what I have for um, growing vegetables and I will pass it over to Andrea now. And let me just give up remote and she will talk and move into cooking. Of course, you can continue to post um, your growing vegetable questions in the chat box. I will catch those as we're going through. So if you think of them as she's speaking, um, we'll grab more, more questions at the end. Sometimes those things pop up later on. All right, so I... You guys can see me, okay. Yep, you're good. All right, so just we're just talking about cooking cool season vegetables here. Um, so we'll get started. So preparing and cooking your vegetables, right? So the idea is I want you to be able to, uh, just from my part here, um, enjoy your vegetables, number one, prepare them safely, store them, cook them, figure out how to use them, and then save them as needed. So we'll get to whatever we can, and maybe in the chat box, if you guys have particular vegetables Anna has talked about that you get too many of and you really wonder what to do with, those would be the ones I'll just kind of spend the most time on because that's what I want to help you with is the idea is to consume more vegetables. So if you guys ever have um, your gardening and you have extra of something and you're just like, I'm done with that, you know, and you don't feel like all your neighbors, they're done with it too. Um, you just are just going to give it up, you call me because I will help you find something fun that you can do with it um, that would be nutritious and also delicious and easy. So that's my goal is to help you guys figure out ways to use those vegetables that you, um, you know, at, that you grow and maybe when you supplement from the store help you to use those too. So we need a lot. They have, a, they help us feel full and satisfied and they can help your weight um, stay stable even at this um, holiday time. So the idea is then to get, try to get half your plate fruits and vegetables, right? So just thinking about that, you know, and thinking about ways to use them, like you can use them in mixed dishes too. It doesn't just have to be like, okay, here's a side of squash. Um, like that top picture, it's a cheesy chicken cauliflower, cheesy chicken cauliflower rice um, dish, but it actually has cauliflower uh, ground up in there and a little bit of rice and the chicken, you know, and broccoli. So it's a way to use some of those things that Ann talked about then, you know, but making it into more of a meal instead of um, here's my vegetable on the side. So trying to incorporate them can get um, picky eaters especially. So just uh, quick things on this. I won't run through everything, but the idea is you don't need commercial washes for the produce. You just wash it. Uh, with uh, cool running water. The idea not to put it in a bowl because the bacteria just gets it gets in the bowl then and you're just washing it in that water. So the cool running water is the way to go. And then 
making sure if you get like um, a couple of those melons Anne was talking about, the cantaloupe and things like that, even the watermelon, wash it. And then the cantaloupes and with produce brush because um, there's bacteria in there. And when you put the melon on the cutting board, then you transfer that bacteria. So you see why? So it makes sense, right? So just also just overall here, making sure to keep the fruits and vegetables, the, that stuff that's gonna be eaten raw separate from any meat or um, seafood, poultry, fish, those things. That's where cross-contamination occurs. So just the idea is you wanna use I, ideally a different cutting board for the two, but if you don't, you just wash with soapy, hot soapy water in between, wash that cutting board. And then once you cut it, it's probably no brainer, store it in the fridge. Um, so tomatoes, excellent out, but then once you cut it, fridge. So let's talk specifics here. So you guys let us, you probably thought about salads, you're on that one. So the bottom is like a blueberry, strawberry, feta salad, and the top is uh, really good for this time of year. You toast those walnuts with pear and then put it on some mixed greens. But you can also think of um, lettuce in a different ways too. Um, you can, like on the bottom right, that is romaine lettuce and it is actually going in a waffle, which you, I got to try some of that waffle and it, you do not know it's there. So just different ways you can use your lettuce. I have a recipe for lettuce bread. It uses a ton of iceberg lettuce. You know, sometimes you get those even bags of it, but just you have too much lettuce. Uh, there's there's lots of ways to use it other than salad. So darker, the better, the color, the, the iceberg lettuce. If you need to core it quickly, you bang it on the counter. You hold the core, right? So you're holding on to the core and you bang it on the cutting board and then the core will just come out. So it's kind of cool. And if you haven't tried that, it's a um, good stress reliever and also really works. And then just storing it with paper towels, excellent. And salad dressing, it clings better to dry. So that's why a lot of people use that salad spinner or you can dry them with a towel. So onions, I think um, there's a lot of myths on the crying and things like that and what might work better. I think there's probably something for everybody, but the ones that make sense the most and kind of science is a little backed it up is wear glasses because it'll be in front of those eyes then and that's where the volatile um, things go, right? To make you cry. Uh, cooling it sometimes, running it under cool water or even storing it in the fridge for just a little bit first and then lighting a candle can actually help. So. That's an idea. And then keeping them out of the fridge normally because it like, will make them go bad faster. Surprisingly, it'll make them sprout. Okay. And you don't have to blanch these to freeze them. So you can just cut onions and stick them in your freezer. If you have extra, it's good to know. And then they work with almost any dish. So here's in roasted vegetables. You can just cut um, big pieces up if you have a lot. Um, caramelizing them, they're great on you know burgers, veggie burgers, and just heating them for a long time, it really makes them kind of, um, it brings out their sweetness a lot. So if you're saying you don't like onions, that would be the way to start for you. Okay, and then also, what is a leek? Just, you know, what is a leek? What is a shallot? Those are things I don't think, you know, we just get enough of. So the leek is the member of the onion family. It looks like a giant green onion, right? And so traditionally just, the white parts and the light green, like at the bottom are eaten and then people throw away the tops, but you can eat the tops. They're um, very hard to eat, sometimes chewy, but they work really well in soups or stews, even to flavor. So keep that in mind. And then you can use those bottoms and um, just heat turns them like the silky flavor, right? So you can add them into soups and they kind of help thicken or grill them, add a little cheese, serve them stuffed. So don't be afraid of growing leeks, just they'd be another delicious way to have a vegetable. And then the shallot is basically like a milder onion. So when recipes call for it, it does have a certain you know flavor and it's just not as less, less pungent, I guess. So that's why they call for that one. And then turnips. So turnips, like Ann was talking about, the greens are really good for you. The top part and the bottom is too. So you can eat them raw or cooked. So it's kind of like you'd use them like a potato, 
plus more, plus you can eat them raw, whereas potatoes, we usually don't. And so, except sweet potatoes, you guys can eat those raw. So they're mildly sweet raw. They have like a peppery thing, but they become like, you know, sweeter and nuttier, earthier when cooked. You don't have to peel them, but they can get a little bit woody. So just make sure you wash them, whatever you do. And then you can steam them at a little, you know, and then like roast them on just a dash with like olive oil, garlic, maple syrup, and let them get a little brown. So great way to use them or in a slaw, like I have on the bottom, use them in place of cabbage. And then we have carrots. So you guys might uh, probably, you know, you can think of ways to use carrots, but just some other ideas, you know, other than the breads and things like that. You can also, people use them, like chefs use them to sweeten their tomato sauce instead of sugar. Because if you grate them, they actually, they have a sweeter, they're a sweeter vegetable. So that would be a great way to take away the acidic taste of the tomato sauce. And then puree, you can use it as a carrot cake dip. I just had that. I thought it was sweet potatoes. It was not, it's puree carrot. And then um, here's a carrot dog. You put that thing in a hot dog. It looks like a carrot dog. Um, looks like a carrot dog. It looks like a hot dog. And so I've done that with kids and um, you just marinate them. A um, little bit of liquid smoke, vinegars, and they turn out kind of like the hot doggy texture and flavor. So another option if you have too many carrots. Eggplant. So the top is baba ganoush, and you might have heard of that dip, but it's made up of tahini and lemon juice and parsley. So tahini is ground sesame seeds. So you can just take that, and that's, um, I actually had that top one in Greece, and that's what it looks like. And then the bottom, just think, you guys can do that. So you would just take like a, a vegetable peeler, right, with an eggplant, you know, or cut it thin, right? And then you can fold it up and stuff it with different things and put tomato sauce on the top. That'd be a great holiday dish. But the eggplant, it really has a neutral flavor. So it takes on the flavor of whatever it's with and it kind of melts in your mouth. So it doesn't have a ton of texture, which bothers some people, you know? And so just different ways you can do it, but you could just stick that whole thing, you know, prick it and put it in the microwave and you can cook that that way. And you can cut it up, you can eat the skin. And um, a lot of people don't, but Eggplant parmesan is probably the most common, right? So I would say as a dietitian, what I want you to do is, you know, take it. And even if you bread it with like um, panko or things like that, oven bake it, right? And you can, um, it is just as delicious. I've made it multiple times, just skipping the breading. So you just take um, eggplant and tomato sauce and cheese and layer it. And it's really good. And you don't need the extra oil or fat. So that's an option. And then peas, so there's those um, snap peas and snow peas. You can eat the pod, like you see the charcuterie board on top there. And then they're pictured there, but then the English peas, those are like the ones we buy when they're frozen. So you don't eat the pods of those. And so that's why they're always shelled. You can add them in different things. And there's also like a pea avocado a guacamole. So you mix the mashed peas with avocado and use it like a guacamole, lots of different ways to do that. But the snap peas and the snow peas, you can eat the pod and it's really good for you. And they're lower carbohydrate than the other kind of peas. Really interesting how that is. So if you're a diabetic, the top one wouldn't raise your blood sugar very much at all. So they'd be great for you to grow. Um, both nutritious though. Tomatoes, so they're high in lycopene, which is really good. And even more so after cooking, that helps prevent cancer. We really want that. So it also helps prevent sunburn. So it's great in the summer and they continue to be ripe, ripe, af, ripe and after picking. Do not put them in the fridge um, unless you know they're starting to really go bad because they will stop that then. But the flavor, it, um, it deteriorates the flavor. It actually kind of kills it. So I, something um, people who, um, like in the tomato industry, they're like, don't put them in there. You know, it's just the way more flavor if you can get them room temperature because they will continue to develop, but then the volatiles um, go like lessen as you have times in the fridge and the coolness um, hurts them. So different ways to use. If you have trouble, please contact me. <laughs> Lots of different ways, but stacked tomatoes, like the bottom, they roast them. So if you've ever thought of that, you know, sometimes we don't think of roasting tomatoes, but it's an option. 
So winter squash, I think the thing that people are just a little intimidated maybe by is like, how do you peel that thing um, and trying to get into there and then cook it. And so it's not very bad at all. It's not like that. So the top I'm using it in a pizza there, you cube it and put it on pizza and the bottom is excellent roasted. Very good for you, great for your skin. But to peel it, you just cut off, hack off the top and the bottom, you can microwave it. Just nuke it for just a couple minutes and it'll be way easier to peel and you can just use a vegetable peeler and just kind of get that off. Um, and another option is you can just bake it with the peel on. You can actually eat the peel, but if, um, you know, it is harder, right? And so, you know, if the texture is, isn't good or something, you just take it off after you bake it and it's so much easier to take off, right? It just comes off, kind of like a sweet potato peel, it just comes off. Or you can prick it and microwave the whole thing and just cook it all like that. Um, my parents, they commonly eat this and they cut it up, you know, peel it and then cut it in cubes and add apples with it. Delicious. And then they cook it that way. And the squash seeds, you can eat those too. So it's really good. So as I mentioned, good for you. So radishes then. Okay. So they're nature's fireballs. They're low in calories. You might think I don't really like radishes, but you could pickle them. You can also stuff them and try roasting them if you don't really like radishes, just it's a great way to have them. So cut them up and roast them in the oven. Just, it always tends, tends to bring out the sweetness. And at the top there's pickled onions, if you see those, and pickled radishes. So here, Swiss chards, collards, and spinach. I kind of group them together because you can actually use them very similar. You can eat them raw or cooked, and um, chard and spinach have a similar flavor. They're really good for you guys. If you need iron, if you're low in iron, some people are, um, try to have um, these and then add some vitamin C. So tomatoes have vitamin C, bell peppers have vitamin C, and then, you know, like oranges, right? Things like that, um, any kinds of fruits almost have vitamin C, but it helps you better absorb them. But tomatoes have a lot and bell peppers do too, and that, those are other vegetables we often pair with that. Collards, let's see here. You know, collards, they taste like a little bit cabbage and kale cross. I have to tell you, you know, you can eat those Swiss chard. I don't know if you remember Anne's picture, but they're the Swiss chard are the ones with the colorful stems. Like they look like rainbows or like red, purple. Uh, those, like the red ones, they taste kind of like the beet flavor. So if you like that, that's, you know, that's how they tasted to me, Rob, but you can definitely eat the stems too. Okay. Just take a little longer than the leaves to cook if you were cooking them. Then we have kale. So you guys might have heard of kale as kind of a superfood, but it is really it's very good for you. Mild cabbage-like flavor. You massage it. You know, sometimes I don't know when I first had kale, I was really trying to like it, but I didn't. You just really have to. Uh, once you massage it, though, it kind of breaks down. So you just take your hands, and the oils in your hands will help break it down or you can spray your hands with cooking spray and you massage it and then use that as a salad then. And you can eat it cooked or raw, like you might've heard of kale chips. So you can easily do those. You just take the kale, right? It's all fluffy, like um, there's some straighter kinds, but they both hold up well. You can make collard chips too. So don't let this limit you, but into things like smoothies. And then I have some other, other things listed there. Kale, um, Ann and I actually have a grow and eat um, little infographic that I'll try to remember to send you guys on kale. So mustard greens, they have a peppery flavor. Here, I'm just, just eating them raw in a salad. So you can definitely do that. You add a little acid. They, you know, they have a little spice to them, I think. But if you are cooking them, you add a little acid at the end, it can tone down that pepperiness, okay? And the small leaves tend to have a milder flavor. So watermelon, you guys are like, we have no problem figuring this one out. But if you do, or you just wanna make it fun, cookie cutters are great with it. Watermelon does not ripen after picked. So that would be something, you know, if you could store it in your fridge once you are ready, you know, just to keep it. Um, yeah, geez, two cups, only 80 calories. And then the top, it's that cucumber, tomato, um, onion, and then you toss like a little bit of feta on there, salad. Those flavors are really, really good together, but you can get your lycopene from there. That's what I was talking about with the cooked tomatoes. 
So that's the red, it's really good for us. And you can eat the rind too. So there's lots of recipes out there, believe it or not. There's watermelon rind pie. So you can save lots of money. You'll be eating just off of your watermelon, different dishes. So yeah, that's kind of another way to have it, right? As in a salad, I don't know. Watermelon.org has a ton of ideas for you. Cantaloupe and other melons. So these will ripen a little bit off the vine. So just keep that in mind. You know, if they're not smelling sweet to you, you can kind of smell the end then you can keep those um, on your counter just a little bit to help them ripen. And then if you have extra, you can freeze them, make them into a frozen yogurt, chilled soups, summer salads, and then you can also use them as bowls. They're really cute like that. You just hollow it out, you know, enjoy the inside or cut it up and use it in your display. But then you have this bowl for fruit that works really well around the holidays. So um, if we can find any fresh ones right now, which is probably not the <laughs> right time for them since we're growing them right now. So, but that would be a really good option. Potatoes and sweet potatoes. Probably thought of a lot of ideas for these, but just remembering sweet potatoes, you know, they can pretty much be used interchangeably, except sweet potatoes, you can eat the tops. They're really good for you. And you can eat them raw, which is different than a potato. So they're different, different, you know, very different plants. And so oven fries, they're stuffable. Think about that. You know, you can make them into soups also and, you know, smoothies, shepherd's pie, pancakes, just put them in there and they're sweeter, right? Um, but then you've seen the potato pancakes, they work applesauce delicious on those. Broccoli. So this name comes from the cabbage sprout cancer fighter. And I'm just thinking, you know, the highlights for this just, um, you know, you can eat it raw or cooked and definitely make sure you use that stem too, because the stem is really good for you also. And that's a um, great way to make uh, broccoli slaw. You might know where that comes from in the store. A lot of people don't like the stems, but that is one really good way to use it. So I think um, coming up on the last ones here, cucumbers. Uh, this is a Greek salad actually in Greece. Then again, and that's their supermarket on the bottom. But you can see um, how um, cucumbers and tomatoes are really prominent in that salad. And if you have both of those growing at the same time, just get out the Greek salad recipe and go at it. It doesn't even usually have lettuce. So that's one way to really use a lot, but it's also really good in a tzatziki sauce. If you don't just like eating them raw, you add yogurt, cucumbers, and dill, and you put that on any sort of meats or fish grilled, delicious. And you can spiralize them, make them into salsa, there's soups. So just um, quickly covering freezing vegetables then, make sure you start with the highest quality when you're doing that. You don't wanna do them at the end. And then with vegetables, um, most of them, except for the onions that I think that we talked about today, need, need to be blanched before you freeze them. So they need to be cooked somewhat, either cook them or they have to be boiled quickly and then um, dipped into cool water just to stop their, stop them from ripening, okay? So the um, drying them too, that's another option. You can dry them. The, you know, you might lose a little bit of vitamin C, but it's a really good way to um, save your vegetables. Like you might've heard of sun-dried tomatoes, right? So you can definitely do that. And that would be a great way to use those tomatoes and you can can them too, okay? So I'm not gonna go into the can. We could do a whole thing on that, but just, um, there's two methods and pressure canning is the only safe way you can do vegetables. Exceptions are if you have tomatoes and a little bit of acid or pickled vegetables, okay? But the, otherwise you need to use a pressure canning because they don't have um, the acid that keeps them safe the other way. And then there's pickling too. So I talked about that with radishes, but you can do that with a ton of stuff. You might have heard of cucumbers, right? <laughs> really pickles. And so they're quick and brined and you can do those. And I think that's all then the main things that I have for you guys today. Just we have that evaluation and we really appreciate it. Um, I'll try to send that uh, as soon as I can with a couple of resources. And um, here's our site. So Ann and I both have a couple of classes coming up and I think we'll both be scheduling more. So um, if you Google Eventbrite and Polk Gardening or Eventbrite and Polk FCS for Family and Consumer Sciences, 
they should pull up and then you'll be able to see what classes we have coming up. And so lots of good ones. I just listened to Anne on like 15 minute. She had some on um, holiday, you know, using the um, vegetables and greens for holiday gifts and things like that. So it was really good. So I have to check these out. And um, that's all. And let me see, we have some questions, Anne. What do you think? Yeah, there's a few for you. Um, I will just say that um, I had a question on white flies and I put that information as well as all the fact sheets and things I referred to. I put that in the chat so people can click on those and download those. Um, there was a question for you about providing the recipe for the, the, the lettuce bread and waffles. Oh God. <laughs> okay, so waffles secret. It's just a normal waffle recipe and you add lettuce. Not even kidding. So um, that's a easy one for me to take. But it's, it's pureed in a blender? Yes, okay. um, pureed it, yeah. And so you could do it whole if you wanted, but it would be a little more obvious. <laughs> and then the lettuce bread, I'm gonna have to dig that out for you guys. It does have some sugar, good amount, because they apparently need to disguise the lettuce and I have decreased that, but I'll send that if I can find it, okay guys? That's the deal. Um, then um, Carol had written, she has lots of mustard greens, if you have ideas for that. Okay, well, I can give her my address, um, but otherwise I would say definitely trying to cook them because they would cook down and you can freeze them. But then adding a little bit, if she likes the mustard, you know, flavor, um, you know, great, you know, definitely have that raw, you know, cut it up into salads and eat it with like, you can cut it up into, uh, you can even put it on pizzas, things like that, but just into pastas, into pasta sauce. And you could also blend that, you know, cook it and put it into pasta sauce. But then just thinking about an acid at, adding at the end, like a little bit of balsamic vinegar, even it should tone down the pepperiness. If you needed help um, from other people eating it, who might not like that as much. I hope that helps. You could probably even cut a little bit of a kale salad or regular salad with some mustard greens, oh, for you sure. know, like just add it in. I know a lot of people do that with different, you know, you got a little bit of extra parsley or a little bit of extra basil and just like chopping them small and throwing them in a salad adds, you know, some more, it's some it. more flavor. And you can use them for the wraps too. You know, if you have the good size leaves, um, that would be one way, but um, probably we won't use like a ton of them, right? So you don't just make like a quadruple mustard wrap. So the people that have a lot of greens, if they're gonna freeze those, should they cook them first or freeze them? Raw? You know, um, <laughs> I have tried freezing a bag of lettuce just once and it's just, there's so much water in there. Um, it doesn't freeze well like that. So if you cook it, that would be awesome. So just cook it and then plus it'll take up less room in the freezer. So um, chopping it up and um, then just, like uh, cooking it a little bit and putting it in there, I'll be great. Cause then you can add it in soups and stews like that, or, you know, even to chilies, things like that, tomato sauces. Great. Um, let's see, a couple more Eggs. questions. Yeah. Good idea. Not even thinking. Um, you said not to put potatoes in the fridge, but when I leave mine out, they go bad fast. Why? Which one? That? Which one's the regular, do you think, or the sweet? I'm well, guessing it's regular matter. potatoes, but would either matter? Um, it just, you know, it's just with our humidity out here, um, they do sometimes, Cal, but we just, they've, yeah. they've really done some studies and they've um, found that just they, ha they turn into their starch turns into sugar, but it affects their flavor somewhat, I think is the main thing. Okay. So I would say, you know, you can keep them in the fridge, um, but then it, like the flavor is what's mostly affected. Oh, that makes sense. So it might prolong their life. Um, yeah, I, I have a hard time with that too, because of the humidity. Mm -hmm. Right. I know you guys. Um, yeah, but I guess some of the starch turns into sugar is the main down home with that. And you're like, wouldn't that be a good thing? I'm, it just with the flavor or it gets woodier or something. There's some reason that I've read because I, you know, I have the same problems as you guys. I have a, you know, then they'll start sprouting. You're like, oh, not yet. And so, um, 
So yeah. Carol mentioned in the chat that she trades mustards for eggs with a neighbor. And I think that oh. is a good idea for um, <laughs> actually just talking about the potatoes too. And I talked about carrots and having lots of them at once. But maybe if you have a neighbor or friend that wants to grow one crop and you grow another and then you just trade, <laughs> you know, half, they get half and you get half or something like that. Um, particularly if you don't want to freeze or it's some hard to freeze or, or something like that, that's a good way to save money and share and also, you know, get together with somebody else, even if you're just dropping them off in the driveway type thing. Um, that's a good idea. Very much. I, um, that's like the COVID gardens, you know, every neighbor does a different vegetable. If you have more sun in your yard, you're growing the tomatoes. <laughs> yep, that's a good idea. I love that. Okay, I think we're about out of time, unless anyone has any other questions for Andrea or I. I appreciate you guys all staying. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Happy holidays.